fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Dave Birthday Martino. No, oh. <laughs> thank you, Al. Well, I have to keep reminding yeah. you that you're a year yes. older, a year older. Yeah, 35. Oh, wait a minute, 53. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say 35. <laughs> Even I wouldn't believe that. I, I turned it around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're 35 almost times two. Yeah, that's right. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, you got you got through another birthday, and yeah, you do anything special? Uh, we just got some hibachi. <laughs> You're not supposed to be swearing on on air. <laughs> hibachi. <laughs> just, just yeah, just some food. Well, I figured it was food. I guess I'm just yeah. out of touch. I didn't even <laughs> hibachi. Isn't that what yeah. they called that old barbecue you could pick up for twenty bucks cheap? Hibachi. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Well, I'm, I'm a cheap date. That's well, I'm yeah. Well, we, we know that. Uh, <laughs> it's not that cheap anymore. No, you know, inflation. No. Inflation. Yeah. Well, let's see. What do we got going on today? So now today we have another author, and uh, he's got a new book out. Now this book is uh, creating a lot of stir here. See a lot of stir, you know, and mm. people are excited and happy. Yeah. And so we've got the author here. Now the book is Anna O. It's a novel, and it's Matthew Blake. So thank you for coming on the show, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I appreciate it. Well, so Matthew, before we get into the book, um, how did you get into this wild and weird world of writing? What made you do that? Uh, well, it's always been a long-standing ambition of mine. Um, straight out of, of college, out of university, I was a speechwriter for politicians. So uh did that for about 10 years, um, wrote some, did some screenwriting, some TV stuff, but always wanted to write a book. So uh I've always been in writing, but uh I didn't want to write a book until I had a idea big enough for a book. And I think uh when I got to Anna o, that I finally felt like I got a, an idea that was worthy of a novel. Wow. So speech writing for politicians. So you got really good at writing fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I mean, the lying convincingly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> that's really good training. Actually, that's what, you know, people should take courses in that rather than. Yeah. Uh... No, I think also you, you learn a lot. I mean, I imagine it's, it's like being a journalist or something that you learn not to be boring, that you've got to get an audience's attention, that uh, to think of the audience and how things are landing. So, yeah, it was great training, uh, great thing to do in your 20s. And uh, but the book was always the dream. So uh, I finally got that. Yeah. Well, and it's important. You, you want to keep the uh, tension on each page. There's got to be something exciting almost on, exactly. on every page right yeah. so i guess i guess the speech writing is really good it is really good training for that because you've got to keep everybody engaged exactly exactly and you you uh you've got a you know you you uh got to put your point across in a sort of punchy way and in a way that's sort of uh catchy and uh gets people grabs people's attention so i think for a thriller writer in particular it's uh it's a great discipline it sort of knocks any pretentiousness out of you now, screenwriting, now that's different again too, right? Because you write a screenplay much different than you would write in a novel because it's not the same. You have to do, be a lot more descriptive in your novel, don't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is different. I mean, the I think the, the things I got from it and learned from it and uh, uh, took were getting that idea, you know, that sort of elevator pitch that people always talk about in certainly in commercial fiction, thriller writing, boiling down an idea until you can say it in one sentence and really uh, thinking about it in a commercial way. I think TV is very good for that because you've got to go into a room and pitch it to producers and uh, you know be interrogated about it. So it really starts training your mind in terms of having a story idea or having a character idea, but then packaging it up in a way which is, uh, which is sellable. So I think that, that was great training too. This is an interesting question I always like to ask, is how you decided 
that this story was good enough to pitch and write. Like you said, you're awaiting until you get the right idea and you put it together. Was there a particular thing that propelled you into, let's say, shipping this out to different agents and publicists and people to say, hey, look at this, I want you to read it? Well, I think it was particularly uh, coming across the idea of people who uh, of sleepwalking, sleep crime, this whole world of people's eyes being open, but their brains being asleep and people committing murder while sleepwalking. Um, and then resignation syndrome, which is the other thing in the novel of people falling into a deep sleep for years on end. And I couldn't believe no one had done a, a big thriller about it before. So I was convinced when I had the idea that someone must have done it and I'd somehow missed the book. Um, but I searched around and I, you know, read very deeply in the genre. So I, I thought I would have seen it if someone had done it. And when I realized they hadn't, I, I was amazed and thought, gosh, I better, I better get going because, uh, the idea is so interesting that, uh, if you can execute it well, there's a, there's a great thriller in there. Right. So you started with the idea and then you created the characters that were going to play in it. I, I'd imagine that's the way it went. It was, yeah. I mean, I started with the idea, started doing the research process. Obviously, it's quite a, a high concept idea. So there's a lot of research involved in terms of getting that authenticity, landing it, making sure that the reader would absolutely buy into uh, the authenticity of all the things I was talking about. And through that, I, I sort of met a lot of interesting people, researched a lot of interesting real forensic psychologists and sleep specialists and started basing the characters on these people I met. And uh, that's how the characters of, of Ben, who's the forensic psychologist, and Anna, who is um, the patient, that's how those characters really started to evolve. I'd imagine that research is probably what took you the longest. I mean, sorting it out, plus deciding who you would go see and how you would uh, kind of address these different people that you uh, needed to get information out of. It was, yeah, the research process was a, was a long period of time, probably about, uh, yeah, about a year, I'd say. It's, um, I'm very pleased that in the book that everything in there has happened or could happen. So it's all absolutely based on real life. And lots of readers have said that they've gone down sort of Google rabbit holes as they realize all this stuff is actually true, all these mystery illnesses and these sort of weird and wacky things. And, uh, I think it is, it's, clarified in my mind that the truth is always stranger than anything a thriller writer could come up with you know it's uh uh when you go out there and start searching it's amazing what is actually out there and uh when you've almost got to put it on the page and make it believable um despite the fact that all of it's actually real well how did you get into the mind of uh your forensic psychologist uh ben as you mentioned well that was i mean there's some great memoirs that have been written uh, by forensic psychologists, by sort of FBI profilers, by uh, all that sort of mind hunter um, mm. that happened in the sort of the 90s and the Silence of the Lambs. So I went back to all that stuff, uh, then read all the more recent things about the development of forensic psychology. And it really is just the most amazing area. It's like a sort of modern day Sherlock Holmes, really, in terms of people solving crimes through mind traces and uh, their profiles of the criminal and uh, such an interesting area. So I basically just immersed myself in all those memoirs and things and uh, talked to interesting people. And uh, yeah, and then out of that, I managed to start thinking, hopefully, as Ben would think and approach a sort of case as as a forensic psychologist would. And so um, your character, your main character, Anna O. Ogilvy, yeah. how do you write a character like that how do you fit into that and and how do you experience it like do you hear her see her do you, is it like watching a movie like um describe kind of how you write that character well that was probably the most fun character to write i think the so in the book um we have diary excerpts from anna of uh the days and events that led up to this this terrible attack she kills her two best friends while sleepwalking and then falls into a four-year-long deep sleep so we go back four years to what led up to this terrible moment and uh that those were great fun to write they really were they were i i just heard her voice really i i um uh and those came quite easily but uh yeah, writing in that style um, and with her viewpoint and the mystery around it. When we start the book, she's sort of the sleeping killer, really. She's she's infamous as the Anna o, uh, the person who killed the two best friends. And sort of exploring her biography and uh, her psychology 
um that was that was fantastic to write who who is anna o then how do you how do you, how would you describe that character well she's so she's a uh, when she committed the crime, she was 25. She's a writer, investigative journalist, a true crime uh, addict throughout her life, has had uh, sleepwalking issues and uh, uh, issues with sleep and uh, occurring at moments of high stress. Um, she's the daughter of a sort of eminent politician mother and a financier father. So, you know, in the centre of things. And um, it, when we meet her, she's, she's running a, a sort of small... Gen Z magazine and she's trying to get a big hit, a big break and uh, starts investigating a, a true crime story um, but she also starts getting these sleepwalking episodes happening again um, and so we we follow her through that, then obviously in the, the main bit of the narrative, the front story she's been asleep for four years so she has sort of almost unwittingly become this global true crime celebrity known all over the world because of the sort of infamous nature of her case and because people are divided over whether she really did carry out the double murder or whether there's some other explanation. You can write about me in the next one. I've been asleep for about 10, <laughs> ten years now and I, I still think it's 1999 so I don't know what's going on. You know. But I don't think I've killed anybody but I could have. How's that? Oh, yeah. 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 Fingers crossed. Hopefully. Yeah. There's a few, I think. No. So that's, that's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Now, when you, when you write a story like this, then, and you're putting this together, is this, you know, it's a great idea and you've got the character and stuff. Is, is it purely an entertainment sort of story or do you have kind of some sort of subtext? Is there some sort of meaning underlying this, this entertainment story? Well, I think, I mean, first of all, it is definitely an entertainment story. It's a thriller. It's fast paced, lots of short chapters, cliffhangers at the end of every chapter. So it, I hope it absolutely thrills and entertains. I think that as I got further into writing it, there is a sort of fascinating idea about the link between the mind and the body and the way in which these mystery illnesses, distress in the mind can cause physical distress in the body and, and how we understand that I think is, is fascinating and that whole area of psychology and mental health, which is such a huge topic in our world today, I think um, that is absolutely fascinating and how we understand how the brain works, but perhaps we don't fully understand and never will how the mind works. Um, and so, yeah, that's there as well. It sort of nods to all those debates. And if people are interested in that stuff, it's all there. But I first and foremost, it's just a it's sort of roller coaster ride of a thriller. Well, did, did the research and writing of this novel, did, did it affect your own sleep? Did, did you ever become <laughs> anxious of going to bed at night? <laughs> it did, it did. I mean, I mean, when you read all these case studies and these stories of, you know, perfectly innocent, seemingly blameless people who sort of suddenly wake up and they've murdered someone and they realize they've been sleepwalking and had no idea of it. Yeah, I mean, it definitely preyed, preyed on my mind. I mean, it, it's hard to get that out out of your head. So, um, yeah, I would say my sleep worsened as I, uh, <laughs> as I wrote the book. And uh, it's taken a while since finishing it to sort of get back to normal if I ever if I ever can. Well, you didn't wake up with a shovel in your hand or something or muddy <laughs> shoes by the bed or anything. Not yet. Not yet. No. Yet. Not yet. Oh. We so, won't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a possibility here, right? <laughs> wow. Hey, or, so are you conscious about how you write the violence in the book? Are you aware of it or is there any violence in it or do you stay away from that? No, there's not much. No, there's not much sort of explicit violence. I mean, it's more hinted at and uh uh, more happens off stage. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't like to sort of shock for shock's sake. I think it's, um, it's scarier, you know, is the sort of whole Spielberg Jaws thing, isn't it? That it's the, the monster is scary if you don't fully see it. And I think that's the same with, uh, with violence and that sort of threat. So yeah, it's not explicitly on the page, but it's, but it's hinted at. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. Let the mind, uh, create exactly. what, what yeah, you know yeah. the, what they're scared of it go in your mind yeah. and you know i think yeah. that's you know that's good i think someone was is alfred hitchcock i think he was the guy that used to do that but, yeah he was brilliant to that yeah. yeah 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 i think i've heard of him i don't think i've seen his stuff <laughs> <laughs> well that's it you know the whole thing is fascinating i you know i love this so but when you're when you're kind of like you said you, you know it, it affects your sleep you're learning a lot about sleep and and about all these weird things and you're writing this tense thriller and you're kind of getting yeah. through this and stuff you kind of and you're hearing your character in a sense when you do all that 
and you lived this way for a year or however long it took you to put it together totally. When you look back at it, how do you think it affected you or how is, has it changed you in any way? Well, yeah, I think it has. I mean, it, it certainly opened my eyes to how little control we have over the mind. I think when you read about the sleeping sicknesses and the mystery illnesses and uh, the cases, there's a famous case of refugee children in Sweden who, who get resignation syndrome and fall into a deep sleep and can't be woken up. And the way in which they call it a functional neurological disorder, but it, 20 years ago it would have been called uh, psychosomatic and that link between the mind and the body. Yeah, I think it really is extraordinary when you get to um, understand that and, and see that even the most eminent neurologists can't really explain why that's happening or um, are mystified themselves. I think that, uh, uh, yeah, is, is, is fascinating and terrifying and particularly on the, the legal defence of sleepwalking and automatism about if you kill someone while the, you're sleepwalking, are you guilty of murder or not guilty? And the law is still very undecided on that. I mean, half the people who use that defence get off, get away with murder. Half who use it uh, get convicted of murder. So no one really knows. And that's always slightly terrifying, but also very mysterious. See, now, Dave, you're going to have to read this so you can figure out how to do this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> get, get away with Much murder. Defense. Yeah. Yeah, get away with it. Only half the time, though. Well, I mean, it's a chance. It might be worth it. On, yeah, it depends on the depends flip on the, of a coin. Yeah, you would be in prison for life. Well, there's not much left. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> You're fifty-three. Come on. Yeah. What do you What do you think that um, people and the media in general um, get wrong about sleep and these sleeping uh, sort of things and people that murder in their sleep, let's say, or walk in their sleep and stuff. What do you think that the we in general in the public don't really understand about it? Well, I think we don't pay enough attention to it. I mean, one of the things that has been so amazing, really, is when I've gone around booksellers and readers talking about the book is how everyone, given the chance, starts talking about their own sleep stories. Once one person starts, everyone sort of erupts with, uh, they, have, they know someone who's a sleepwalker or a sleep talker or has night terrors or sleep eats is another one. Um, and uh, it's not something they ever really shared before, but uh, I, you know, there's this amazing statistic that, the average person spends around 33 years of their life asleep. So it is this entire second world that all 8 billion of us on the planet have, and uh, we don't really uh, share much about it or talk much about it. And it's, uh, uh, we all have nightmares, we all, we all experience this, and um, uh, I think we can, we can all be more open about it. Yeah, and that's a fascinating area too, the nightmares and dreams and stuff. Did yeah. you kind of, did you work into that area too as well? Like what, how can you separate, let's say, sleepwalking from a dream? Well, exactly. That's the really scary thing. I think, um, yeah, so I did look into all of that as well. And uh, I talked to one uh, neurologist who said, really, the only way you could tell uh, definitively if someone was sleepwalking or not when they commit a crime is to attach electrodes to their head while they were committing the crime, um, wow. which is obviously impossible. So basically, even the most eminent specialist would not be able to conclusively tell you whether someone who claims they're sleepwalking was actually sleepwalking when they committed the crime or whether a nightmare they were having they acted out in reality and um killed someone so uh yeah i think that the night terrors and nightmares we've all had that moment when we uh we wake up and the nightmare is still more real than reality and uh, it takes a while to realise that that terrible thing we were afraid of during the night isn't actually real. And the book, I guess, starts with the idea that what if your nightmares turned out to be real? What, what's the most surprising thing you learned during doing uh, research on this novel with sleep and sleep-related crimes? The most surprising is uh, how awake we can look while still being asleep. So there was some amazing stories of people who... Uh, people had very bad sleepwalking problems and used to get up in the middle of the night, go for long drives, come back, get back into bed in the morning, have absolutely no memory at all of what they'd done during the night. So you're able to function on a very 
sophisticated level without actually being awake. It's very, or your rational part of your brain isn't sort of engaged. So that really calls into question our whole concept of being awake or asleep. And uh, yeah, so that idea that you can sort of be in an in-between state where you can function, but you're not actually conscious of being awake. That That's pretty terrifying. Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. Well, that's, it's interesting. Where where do you think you get your influences from? I've always been a huge fan of uh, Agatha Christie. Um, she was the sort of first person I ever read where I realized books could be fun and uh, enjoyable. So that's always been a key influence. There's a lot of Hitchcock references in the book. Uh, and I certainly say he's a, a huge influence. But I'm a massive uh, thriller and mystery reader. So I love, you know... Harlan Coburn and Michael Connolly and Lee Child and uh, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, a mix of sort of uh, classic crime and uh, and lots and lots of modern modern mysteries. And, and so what do you think you get out of the book then? How, how does it make you feel? What I get out of it is uh, just joy when um, readers are surprised by the ending and shocked by the twist and like the characters and just had a good time with it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've had... I, I, as a thriller lover, I know what I get out of reading my favourite thrillers, and uh, it's been just amazing to hear readers all across the world um, saying they connect with the characters, and you know that it taps into some anxiety they have of themselves, and you know they've had a had a good and fun reading experience. So that's that's the main thing. So what's next? What comes up now after this? This is a, a big novel to to start yeah. out with. So uh, where are you going to go after now? Are you starting to write something else already? I've already written it. Yeah, I'm doing the edits on it now. So hopefully it will be out in uh, 2025. It's I was looking for another topic that was sort of as big and universal as sleep. And I came across some amazing stuff on false memory. So the uh, the second book is all about false memory. It's set in Paris. Uh, people estimate that about a third of our most treasured memories didn't happen in the way we remembered them. And every time we access a memory, we actually edit it um, just very slightly. So it's looking at all of that. And uh, yeah, doing the final touches to that now and that should be out next year yeah that's an amazing thing too right because when you're in the yeah. crime world too right true crime a lot of you can't you know they talk about witnesses and stuff and people that exactly. say things it, it, it's not really that dependable is it not at all and i, I mean lots of stuff's coming out uh now you know about eyewitness testimony and if people have been convicted on eyewitness testimony how how unreliable that is and lots of amazing stuff there and uh it's quite a thought you know if some of your your most personal memories about the past have been uh, sort of edited and adapted in your own head and that actually the reality was was very different that's uh, that changes our notion of the past and and who we are so uh, yeah book two looks for all that stuff yeah because the brain just kind of fills in the blanks doesn't it when it does yeah well. and wow. connects things that happened years apart and puts them together and uh, there's one particularly interesting idea about source confusion so uh, if you're a child and your parents tell you something that happened, you can you can sort of almost steal that anecdote and it becomes a memory and you become convinced that actually you were present at the at something you weren't and uh, all those sorts of weird tricks of of the mind. Well, who is your favorite type of character to write? Uh, is it is it like an, an evil person or someone that's kind of on the edge or doing something wrong? Or do you like writing someone good and happy? Oh, gosh. I mean, uh, I, I like the sort of unreliable narrator, the, the person you don't quite trust. I think that's that's probably the most fun thing to write if you're writing a psychological thriller and someone who's sort of slightly teasing the reader, leading the reader on, uh, and who the, the reader, when they're going through the book, doesn't quite know what's being kept from them. And, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the most compelling type of character to write. Did your characters ever surprise you? Did they uh, try to uh, take the... Uh the plot off the rails or anything like that? Yeah, no, they did, yeah. I mean, I had it pretty well mapped out, so I have, you know, the start and the end mapped out. I think if you're you're writing a thriller with a big twist, you, you sort of need to know that you can land that big twist and where it's going. But I always leave enough room um, for the characters to sort of go their own way and, and do that sort of thing and leave a bit of room for spontaneity. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say the characters do often. And it sounds sort of silly saying they surprised me because I'm inventing them, but um, they... You, you 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 need to sort of write it to see how they that pans out and some of those relationships and how they um the dynamic between the characters certainly uh can surprise me as the author yeah don't worry about sounding crazy because that helps <laughs> that sells it even better like crazy they sometimes have a mind of their own <laughs> they do. Yeah. They do. no they do definitely if they ever i think 
characters who are, you know, they're fully rounded and they're proper characters and you've created them, then, uh, yeah, I think you, 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 I think it's probably more your own unconscious working, uh, you know, Stephen yeah. King about the, you know, the, the boys in the basement or whatever it is that that's your unconscious working. And so when you start writing, the character does, does things you're not consciously creating. Right. Well, we have tons of writers that come on and say that, you know, they, they actually, their characters are real, right? And they, talk yeah, with them yeah. and they're driving and they're doing all this stuff yeah. and, and it's like and we wonder why the world is this way <laughs> <laughs> it's like they let them drive and have a license oh right. cow that's crazy <laughs> yeah i haven't gone that far thank you yeah. are you are you outlining your your stories or do you have it all planned and kind of you work it all out and then you fill in details or are you just do it as it comes i i tend to i do a bit of mix of both so um yeah, I outline all the sort of the big plot twists, the big points. So beginning, the middle, the end, you know, so I, I know how to lay all the clues and that it's all going to fit together. And then, but in terms of how I get from point to point, I, I try and leave a little bit of room. So every day when I turn up to the desk and write, there's a, there's a sort of slight risk factor, a slight excitement that uh, you're making something up as you go. So I, I find that. Uh, balance between the two has sort of worked perfectly for me. Back to political speech writing. <laughs> Make something up. <laughs> uh, you know, but it, you have the foresight. Like when you started putting this together, you had the idea, you got the character stuff, and you were working it out and doing research, and how you saw it back then and yeah. how it ended now, how it is published as. Did it turn out kind of where you had it in mind at the beginning, or is it, is it completely different? No, it's pretty much what I had in mind, I think, actually. Um, uh, particularly the, the cover it's got, it was, uh, very unusually, actually. It's, the cover has been used in almost every territory it's been published in, which is nearly 40 territories. And it's this a sort of iconic image of an eye. And then, uh, in every country, the, the O is a different color. So, uh, yeah, I think that look, the branding, the, uh, the whole package, that, that was really what I had in mind when I started. And, uh, what I was trying to do is find a twist and a surprise that even the most seasoned mystery lover would uh, would find surprising. You know, we've got a, uh, speaking of Agatha Christie and Alfred Hitchcock, I think, you know, they were dealing with audiences that might see, you know, one film a week or one film a month. We've got sort of box sets where people have seen every twist ever done and, you know, are so uh, able to spot where things are going. So my my aim with this was to genuinely surprise people and keep people on their toes and uh, it seems to have done that which is great how do people get a, in contact with you or you've got social media set up if you've got a website yeah no, i do definitely okay. uh so matthew uh dash blake.com is the website but i'm on instagram at matthew blake writer and on x at uh matthew underscore underscore blake tiktok not on TikTok. Come on. <laughs> I haven't ventured to yet, but uh, I'm told you've got to let TikTok creators create organically. So, uh, uh, yeah, just Instagram and X for the moment. Well, you get on there and just dance. Hold your book up. and <laughs> I don't think I, I, I couldn't inflict that on the world. I don't think the world's ready. <laughs> well, sometimes the shock and the drama is what draws them in, right? You know? Um, so this has been a real pleasure. And and so the last, last question I have is, like, who in your real life have you uh, – Killed off in any of your books? <laughs> <laughs> no one, no one I can admit to. I know. I mean, it's uh, oh. the only people I take from close real life I portray glowingly on the page. So, uh, no, there's no one I've uh, inflicted revenge on in that way. I can't say the same for book two, though. We'll have to. Oh, um, good. <laughs> good. And we'll need names and a phone number. We'll get them on sure, the line sure. when we're yeah. interviewing, and you can have it out. You know, that would be yes. amazing. Well, we I really have nothing less. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. Now, the book of course, called, of course is called Anna O. Our guest is the author, Matthew Blake. So thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Matthew. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.